QuickBooks Online. Statement of cash flows. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online. We're going to be using the free QuickBooks Online test drive searching in our online search engine for QuickBooks Online test drive selecting the option that has Intuit.com and the URL Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Pick in the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. Zooming in a bit by holding down control up on the scroll wheel currently at 125% on the zoom in. Noting that with the cog drop down, we're currently in the accountant view as opposed to the business view. We'll try to toggle back and forth between the two views so you can get a look at both of them. We're then going to be right clicking on the tab up top in order to duplicate it to put reports in as we do every time. Right click in the duplicate a tab to duplicate it again. Back to the tab to the middle, going down to the reports on the left hand side, picking the balance sheet report. As that's thinking, tab to the right, reports on the left. This time, the profit and loss, the income statement report. We're going to be closing the hamburger up top, otherwise known as the ham boogie. Change the range up top from 010122 to 123122 tab. Run it. And then back to the tab to the left and close the boogie. Scrolling up, range into the change in 010122 tab, 123122 tab, and run it to refresh it. These are the major financial statement reports. That's the process that we do every time. Now we're going to be opening up other reports, starting with the other financial statement report of the statement of cash flows. And most of these other reports we want to think of as giving more information about one or multiple line items on the balance sheet and the income statement. Now the statement of cash flows after having said that is a little bit different because it's another basic kind of financial statement report, but it's still a report that you kind of think of as being constructed after having constructed the balance sheet and the income statement. So let's open it up and then I'll continue discussing it. We're gonna be right clicking on the tab to the right, duplicating that tab so that we can then go down to the reports again and then I'm just going to type in up top to find it. That's how I usually find the statement of cash flows. Statement of cash flows. There it is. That's the one we want. Let's change the range up top. We're going from 010122 to 123122 and run it. There we have it, the statement of cash flows. Now, when you're thinking about the financial reports, oftentimes we'll list the statement of cash flows as one of the major financial statement reports. So you got the balance sheet, you got the income statement, you've got the statement of cash flows. The reason we don't open it up every time we do the data input as we do with the balance sheet and the income statement is because you can kind of think of the statement of cash flows if you were to construct this by hand as being constructed after you build the balance sheet and the income statement. So in other words, if I go back to the balance sheet, when we first set up our system, we're going to lay down the chart of accounts. Then we're going to hit the plus button and we're going to enter these journal entries in the format of forms that then create the journal entries. These will have an impact on at least two accounts on the balance sheet or the in and the income statement. And that is going to be keeping us in balance with the double entry accounting system. And it's nice to then go to the balance sheet and income statement, drill down on the accounts affected to get back to the source document. So I would think of these as our major two financial statement reports being constructed directly from the data input. Then we're going to use this information or the system uses this information to create the statement of cash flows which shows activity, what happens over time in a similar fashion as the income statement you'll note on a cash flow type of basis. 
Now, note that you might be thinking, well, what if I have my books, my balance sheet, and my income statement on a cash flow basis? Is the statement of cash flows redundant? Not necessarily, because even if you're on a cash flow basis, then like your small business, let's say that's on a cash flow basis and you're doing your books primarily to get your uh, to get your tax returns done at the end of the year or something like that, there's still some components that are going to be accrual based. So if you have, for example, fixed assets, the tax code, even though it might be on a cash based system or you might be recording on a cash based system, will force you to put assets on the books and then depreciate them. That's an accrual type of thing. If you deal with accounts receivable, uh, then you're going to have that's an accrual account in and of itself. You're on an accrual system. And so there's going to be differences between cash flow and and a, a accrual basis. And then same with the accounts payable. And then if you've got any kind of prepayments, then also those are going to be accrual kind of items. The reason the accrual system is is required oftentimes if you're publicly traded, for example, and is considered the go to for reporting purposes and projection purposes is if we go on the income statement, it's often easiest to see that if you were to compare multiple periods, if I hit the drop down here and say we want to compare like quarters, let's say, and if I was to run multiple quarters here and do a comparison of these last two quarters, uh, let's do it this way. Let's go, let's go back to the totals. Let's run it. I'm going to go up here and let's just do, let's do one month. So let's go 12, uh, let's go one, two, two to 12, 31, two, two, run it. And then I'm doing a comparison to the previous month and do a dollar change on it. So I'm going to run it. So if I was trying to think, how did I do on December versus November, then I, I would have distorted numbers if I recorded, say, a purchase of a building in December for $100,000. Then there would be a complete distortion of my comparison. And it's not really fair to do that uh, from one perspective, because you'd be saying, hey, look, even though I bought the building in December, let's say, uh, or let's say I bought it in November, even if I bought it in November, I'm still going to be using it in December. And that's the idea of an accrual. So we're going to say to be fair to the two months so that I have a comparable amount of data. If I buy something that's going to have an impact on multiple periods into the future, I want to put it on the books as an asset and then, you know, depreciate it, record the expense when I actually consume it. So I have more comparable data. Now, in principle, that's a great concept. It allows us to have comparisons more accurately, but we also want to have a cash flow statement. So now I'm, I've lost my income statement is not on a cash flow basis. Well, now I can add on and have the best of both worlds in essence, a statement of cash flows. But the statement of cash flows is a little bit tricky because now I'm going to have to kind of take what I did on an accrual basis and basically adjust it to a cash flow basis. So that's kind of the, the general idea. So let's look at the categories of the statement of cash flows here. I'm going to collapse everything inside as we've done with our other reports, just to get a feel for what we're doing here, we can see there's three main categories, operating, investing, financing, then you got the net, net cash increase for the period and the cash at the end of the period. That 4,063.52 dollars should tie out to what's on the balance sheet at the end of the period. So if I go back on over here, you got to pull out the trusty calculator because if there's something in undeposited funds, then you got to pick that up. So here we've got cash of 2001 plus you've got the undeposited funds here plus the 2062.52. There's the 4063.52, which ties out to the statement of cash flows. So in that sense, you could say, okay, the statement of cash flow kind of ties into the cash. It's giving you more detail on the cash balance, but that's really way too simplified a thought process because it's kind of like a bank reconciliation in that we're not just looking at the cash balance by checking the transactions on a cash flow basis. We're basically looking at the whole, you know, accounting system on a cash flow basis type of system. So you can kind of think of it as if you went to the balance sheet over here and we think of the income statement as basically a breakout of the equity section, which is assets minus liabilities. Now we're kind of reversing everything and we're kind of breaking out in accordance with the cash flow 
accounts to see the detail how we got to the current position in cash flow, beginning, balance, cash flow, what happened during the period, mainly income statement activities, but on a cash basis to get us to the uh, ending point that we are at. Okay, so back to the statement of cash flow. So we've got these three major categories of the statement of cash flows. The operating activities is by far typically the largest category that we have. And you can think of it kind of like the income statement, our operating activities type of thing on a cash flow basis. Although most of the time we use what we call an indirect method, reconciling net income on the income statement to net income on the statement of cash flows or operating activities. And then we have financing activities, which typically deals with the purchase of fixed assets because that's, that's I'm sorry, investing activities, which typically has to do with the purchase of fixed assets. And then we've got the financing activities, which typically has to do how we're gonna finance the business, which might include the owner putting money into the business or taking out loans, paying off loans, paying dividends or uh, owner's equity. So these are the cash flow uh, areas. If I open them up, like I say, operating is typically the largest cash flow item. Notice if you were to think about it intuitively, you would probably say, okay, if, if I'm going to make a statement of cash flows and the reason for this is because the income statement is on an accrual basis so that I have this nice comparison on the income statement, then I'm just going to take each line item on the income statement and record it on a cash based system and that will convert it to a cash based system. That would be the, the simplest thing to think about or the easiest way to visualize what you would do. In other words, instead of recording revenue, uh, when, for example, I enter an invoice because I didn't get cash on an invoice, I wait until I receive the payment. And instead of entering an expense, when I enter a bill, I wait until the bill is paid. And then I just run my income statement on that basis, kind of eliminating the cash items. Now you could do that and that would be an operating activity in essence statement, but it would be under a direct method. And most statement of cash flows are actually going to use what's called the indirect method, even though the direct method is more intuitive in that we're going to start with the end balance net income. So net income, if I go back on over here and I say this goes from 010122 and run it, net income down below is the 164246. So there is that. And then we're going to have all of our adjustments reversing out the accrual components to get to, in essence, the net income on a cash flow basis or net cash is pro pro net cash provided by operating activities. So, so this kind of confuses people when they first look at it, because like I say, we're, we're backing into it instead of starting from the top down, going from income minus expenses on a direct method. Why would we do that? Because it's kind of possible you would think QuickBooks could kind of put together the operating uh, section on a direct method. However, most of the time for reporting purposes for like generally accepted accounting principles, they actually like the indirect method better because it gives you a reconciliation. So if I was just to, to recreate the income statement top down, I don't get this nice reconciliation of net income that ties out. There's the differences that get me to the cash flow provided by operating activities. Therefore, many times regulations that allow the direct method also still want the indirect method. And therefore the default is just to use the indirect method where you have this nice reconciliation. Now, the funny thing about the indirect method is that you kind of back into this area because notice that what we're getting to here too is net income in essence on a cash flow statement on a cash flow basis. So you would think that you would just be looking at the income statement to do that. But what we're ending up doing to back into that is we're going to the balance sheet and we're looking at the difference between the prior period and the current period. So I can take another difference one here and say, let's make this compared to the previous period and dollar change, right? We're looking at, we're looking at the difference because if, if this is where I stand, let's look at the accounts receivable. For example, if, if this is where I stand as of right now and I subtract it out 
of what happened in the prior period, which was zero in this case, this is, this is the change between those two. And because this is an accrual account, it doesn't have cash related to it, I can kind of back into what, what, what was the non-cash transaction impact on the income statement because the other side of accounts receivable when we record an invoice is revenue. So we're going to kind of back into uh, the, the reversal of the non-cash items by looking at the differences in all of the balance sheet accounts. And that, that becomes quite uh, complex to actually think about. So we actually have a course on building the statement of cash flows. And if you can construct a statement of cash flows, then that actually gives you a, a much better understanding of the accrual concepts in general. So highly recommend doing that. It's a good practice. Notice that all of these accounts, the other side of them, have an impact on the income statement. So accounts receivable, invoice form typically impacts it. The other side of it is revenue. Inventory. Typically, when you sell inventory, the other side is cost to goods sold on the income statement. Accounts payable. Typically, the other side of accounts payable balance sheet account is an income statement account of an expense. At least, you know, MasterCard is going to be a credit card we're usually buying an expense. Amazon uh, revenue. Pay this is another payable. So other side often expense. Board of equalization. Other side's an expense. And notice they have the loan payable up here, which is kind of interesting because uh, you would think that possibly the loan payable would be under the financing activities, right? Because a loan would typically be a financing type of activity. So also just realize that although QuickBooks gets to something that is in balance here, ties out to the, to the, to the balance sheet, it may not always be perfect because if you have complex transactions, such as you're purchasing something uh, like property planting equipment on account, you're financing it, then QuickBooks may not be able to categorize properly what's going on. And, and so it gives you a pretty good statement of cash flows, but it might not be perfect. And you might have to, if you were to do external reporting, do some adjustments to it. But in any case, then you've got the, in, so, so then you've got the investing activities. So no, normally these are going to be like, things that have to do with the the purchase of equipment or the sale of equipment property plants and equipment a balance sheet account activity and you can kind of tell it would be not under the operating which is the default that most stuff goes into notice we're now going down to a a balance sheet account again but the the key here is the others we're not putting it into the operating activity because the the other side isn't an income statement account necessarily when we buy equipment we pay cash and then the other side goes to if we paid cash if we financed it it gets more complicated but if we paid cash then the other side goes to a balance sheet account that's why it's not up here in the operating activities why is it called investing because you would think it would just be stocks and bonds maybe but investing here is a more broader sense of investing we are investing in the fixed assets because we're putting our capital into the fixed assets in order to generate revenue in the future. That's so that's in, in that sense, it's in the investing activities. And then we've got the financing activities, which once again, you would kind of think the loan payable would possibly be in. This is the, the, the activities that also don't typically have the other side as an impact on the income statement, therefore not in the operating activities. So you put them down here. Uh, in the financing activities, which would typically be things like taking out loans. You take out a loan to finance the purchase of the assets. The, that's, and then you also could have financing activities for paying off the loans. And then you could have financing activities for the owner putting money in if it was a sole proprietorship, an owner investment. Uh, and from the owner taking the money out, if it was a sole proprietorship, a draw. If it was a corporation, when, the, when the, they put money in, that would be the issuance of capital uh, stock. And when they take the money out, it would be a, a dividend. So that would be the financing activities. And then if we take those three changes, we've got the 1896.02 minus the 13495 plus the 15662.5. That gives us our change here of 4063, our change in cash. And if I go back to the balance sheet, there's there's nothing in the prior period. So the change in cash is just the, the whatever the change right here, which would be the two two oh oh one plus 
and then we'd go undeposited funds plus the uh, two six five eight points no that's not the undeposited funds hold on a sec back 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 two oh six two point five two that's the four oh six three so there's you know the change and obviously the there's the ending balance because there wasn't anything in uh, the prior period so, and that should tie out of course to the ending balance and that's how it kind of neatly fits in to uh, tying into the balance sheet so that's the general idea also just note from a technical standpoint here oftentimes there's kind of an issue with these with these names like so it says total adjustments or right here it says net cash provided by and you could say well what if this was a, a negative number notice down here it says net cash provided by that's a little bit wrong because notice it wasn't provided by it went down so it would have to be used in. That's one of the issues with a statement of cash flow. You can use a generic term here, like net cash change, you know, by in, in investing activities. But usually they, let, they like to use the term provided by or used in or something like that, which means you got to actually change the words. And that's something that QuickBooks doesn't always do here if you want to get, you know, picky on it. And it's net cash, so you got a provided by kind of terminology here. And then you got the net cash increase for the period. Again, what if it went down? Will QuickBooks change this to a decrease? I don't think so, right? I think it's gonna always be like that way. So you gotta kind of be a little careful about the terminology. Might not be a big deal to you, but just to just to point out if you were to get a review by someone in, a, in an accounting office, they they like to, you know, that would be something they, would, they should point it out. They like to point it out, but they should point it out because it's, it's a little bit uh, wonky there. And then, it's kind of interesting to note that this operating activity, you would think that you can go to the income statement and just hit your little button up here, it's changing it to a cash based system. And you should basically tie out to, to an income statement that is on, you know, basically the direct method of the statement of cash flows. It's not perfect. So if I go over here and say, run it, and I check it out down here, then I got a, a negative 1904.12. And over here, I've got uh, 1896.02. So there's a little bit of a difference between that, but you know, you can, you, that's the general idea. This operating activity is in essence, kind of giving you a cash flow basis as opposed to an accrual basis of kind of like the income statement, but it's giving you a reconciliation format. You could take your income statement and remember, you don't want to use this toggle button to kind of feel like you're running a cash based system because that will be dependent on whether you're using accrual forms, meaning are you using an invoice or just recording revenue with a deposit, a bank deposit form or a sales receipt? Are you using a bill form or just recording expenses with the expenses? But uh, if you use this properly and you then, and you're then thinking, okay, I know I'm on an accrual system or whatever, I've entered my data. Now I'm just, I want to see the difference if I was to switch over to a cash based system, which would in essence be kind of like the first section of the statement of cash flows, but on a direct method. And that can give you an, an interesting, you know, look at your, at your performance basically on a cash flow system. Although it's not perfectly tied out to uh, what we have over here on the operating activities, possibly because of some of the play between what's on what's on the books up top versus the investing and financing activities. But that's that'll give you a, a general idea. So in summary, just realize that your major financial statements are the balance sheet and the income statement. That's how I would think of it. And you're inevitably going to have someone ask you, but what about the statement of cash flows? It's also a major financial statement. And you're going to say, yes, it is a major financial statement but it's actually kind of constructed from oftentimes the balance sheet and the income statement. Therefore, I'm always gonna look at the balance sheet and the income statement first when I'm building my data input to check the impact on the balance sheet and the income statement. And then if that's correct, then I should be able to construct in essence, my statement of cash flow or QuickBooks have it constructed for me uh, from it. And also just remember the statement of cash flows constructed from QuickBooks may not be perfect, right? It reconciles, it ties out, but if you have complex financing transactions and investing transactions and buying equipment and disposing of equipment, oftentimes depreciation 
uh, is kind of an issue when you buy and sell equipment. You might have to get a little bit more detail to really hone down and get a proper statement of cash flows, but QuickBooks gives you a good, a good baseline.